Behind me is the new Genesis G90, and I was extremely excited about doing video about this car, but I wanted to wait until spring or summer because of this. I feel like I'm in the middle of purgatory in Silent Hill, but it is what it is. It was either do it now or potentially never do it. So here we go, let's take a look. When you look at the Genesis G90 from the outside, it looks almost identical, namely in the front to the G80. And that is because now they're trying to give themselves a brand identity. They look so similar. But a lot of those similarities disappear when you get to the side and the back of this. Now in Casablanca white, this looks extremely fancy, namely in the sunlight, which we don't have here, but there's a strong metallic fleck throughout the entire paint of this car. It's like a pearlescent color and it just kind of exudes this luxury feel and look. The most striking aspect of the G90 is it looks like a luxuring grand touring machine. It is so long, I can't even tell you. It barely fits in my garage. I feel like I need to upgrade it to a warehouse. But in all reality, this vehicle is longer by almost two to three inches than the Honda Odyssey minivan, the Chrysler Pacifica, and Toyota Sienna. So that gives you some perspective at just, just how large this is. Now, one of my big complaints or gripes about the Genesis G80 was the exterior. It just looks ambiguous. You could see other vehicles in the sheet metal. The front kind of looks like Audi or Chrysler, and the back looked like an Alexis LS to me. With the G90, it kind of changes some of that. It doesn't look as much like every other car. Now, some might argue it's still a little bit bland. It, it lacks character, but I think the back quarter panel and the rear end of this car is where it stands out the most. Now, let's talk about the business end of the G90, the rump. You expect this is gonna have a big trunk, no doubt. And it has an electronic release. It goes up and down for you. You don't have to stress your rotator cuff closing this thing. When I first saw this, I thought, holy crap, is this huge. Now, if you're somebody that is in the transportation industry, you've got fired from Uber, you can't drive people around anymore, guaranteed you could go down to your local funeral home and get a contract job driving around stiffs all day. This thing could literally fit five or six adult bodies in here. It's an unbelievable chasm. It gets me excited to even just get in the back, honestly. Now, instead of standing out here getting my tongue frostbitten, let's take this to the shop and have Scott Turbowski take a look at the underbody and all the exciting mechanicals of the Genesis G90. So this is the G90, the Equus is done in the US. Now we have two Genesis vehicles at this point in time and there's going to be a third one. And I don't know what it is, if it's an SUV or a sports car, but that's immaterial. You have the G80 and the G90. We already looked at the G80. They should have kept Equus. Yeah, they probably should have, but no. So what we have here, this is an almost, this is an elongated G80 chassis. So the G90 and the G80 are closely related. Now, Hyundai Engineering won't tell me how much of this is the same as the G80, but you can guarantee that probably the most of the platform is. It's all the same except for this part that they welded. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now, the G80, as we know, was set up, well, the suspension was set up by Lotus. Lotus came in, was contracted out to help them fine-tune damper, spring rates, anti-roll bars, all of that, and now a lot of that information is you know, being rolled out into other Hyundai and Kia vehicles. Now in the case of the G90, Lotus had nothing to do with this. They had Albert Berman handle the suspension setup, the dampers, the spring rates, the tuning of this chassis. Who is this man? He is 
formerly of the BMW M division. Mm -hmm. When I was 16, it was clear that I have to work on race cars, I have to be race driver, all these things. So, and I have been doing some uh, race driving as a hobby race driver while I was a student. And then, of course, then reality come in. I finish my studies and then I become engineer and I did some race car projects and yeah, that's what it is. I was in charge of tuning, so I put my hand on many BMW cars, so whatever, the Z1 and uh, 7 Series, 12 cylinder, whatever, and then working on M cars uh, in the 90s, uh, E46, M3, E39, M5, the latest M3, M4, all kinds of cars. And it's funny because I didn't know that before yesterday when I did my driving bit. And the first thing that I thought of when I was tearing this thing up in the corners was it feels very BMW-ish. The solidity that you get, kind of, the, it, it, it hides its size and weight. When you're behind the wheel, there's just this sense of solidness to the car. And that's evident all throughout this vehicle. You can tell they are finally starting to get it. Not finally, they have finally gotten it. And the Genesis brand, you have double wishbone suspension in the front uh, with dual ball joints at the top and the bottom here in the hub and the upper A-arm. Uh, the other thing that they've employed here is we don't have air suspension, which I am absolutely impressed with given Thank how- Thank God they didn't. I know, and it, it reduces the overall cost to replace, to troubleshoot, to fix. It doesn't go bad though. Oh yeah, I know, it never does. Struts, I mean, this kind of stuff leaks. Oh, that's- Airbags are- good for the life of the car. Yeah, right, what, 20,000 miles? <laughs> <laughs> the S90 we just got out of had air suspension in the back, and that car rode like a Chevy Cruze compared to this. And I'm not kidding, it, ro it rode horrible compared to this car, and I, that's why I couldn't believe that it didn't have air suspension. It's that good. Now the dampers are adjustable, are adjustable based on different drive modes, but they are constantly adjusting themselves. They are not a fixed rate. So whenever you're in sport, comfort, individual, it doesn't matter, they're, they're always changing dynamically. So that's something to note. The next thing to talk about, Scott, is brakes. Now this is the twin turbo V6 in here. So you get smaller brakes than you would with the V8. <laughs> and you wouldn't know it by looking wow. at them because they look massive. I don't see how they could fit any, well, maybe a quarter inch bigger. Well, you could probably get 20 inch wheels then, so. You know, you're right, the wheels are the same, and you really? are right. They're 14.2 inch rotors on the front, and when you go to the V8, they're 14.8. <laughs> and oh, you have, it's amazing they can even, I mean, there's hardly any room. Yeah, it is, it, it, oh. it's a very tight space. They maximize this with the 19 inch wheels, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the backs are 13.4 inch rotors, but the, the reason they did these wheels, when you look at it, they kind of look weird. Not no. right. They, they don't fit the car. They don't fit the car, but the reason they're made this way, they're aerodynamically designed to reduce air and road and tire noise. So there's less road noise that's transmitted from these wheels and tires, and that's why they did it this way. So I thought that was an interesting aspect of this car, and it's just one of those little things that adds up to a lot because it is very quiet, as you know. Anyway, in the back of the car, this is the all-wheel drive, and they call it H-Track all-wheel drive, and it is an option, you don't have to get it. And let me just say this, if you are in a good climate and you never have to deal with snow or inclement weather, just go with the rear-wheel drive yeah, option. Yeah, why would you buy all-wheel drive? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's gonna be quicker, you're gonna save the weight, but this all-wheel drive system, I've had it in a really bad conditions, and I've put it off-road too, just to see how it you know, gets traction. <laughs> Uh, put it, it off road. Oh, I put it in mud. I took it into grass that was just nasty. It, it is no issue at all. They have it tuned extremely well. So the torque split for this car is 4258 in all the normal modes. So that's eco, you know, the, the regular driving modes. Now, when you put it in sport mode, the ECU will allow 90% of its power to go to the rear. So it's designed to feel more rear wheel drive biased in sport mode only. So that's something to note if you're driving this and you're getting the all wheel drive, that's how you get the more rear wheel drive feeling is like leaving it in sport mode. Uh, but I am really impressed with this car's ability to always feel more rear wheel drive, but it's extremely neutral. There's no understeer, no oversteer, under about that 80, 90% threshold. So in terms of the back suspension, Scott, it's a multi-link. 
Again, you have adjustable dampers that are electronically controlled, no air ride. And you pointed something out that it has. Camber and toe adjustment. Yes, which is nice. And you know what that means. It stands it. Yeah, first thing we're gonna do is stands this. I'm gonna buy this specific unit and we're gonna be the first ones that can get the car like back to the future stand style. And I'll have a little smoke that comes off the bottom of the wheel so it looks like it's gonna fly. A quick thing to note about this eight speed automatic, and we saw this in the G80 and it was huge. You had said it looked like one of the biggest transmission cases you had ever seen. Mm -hmm. This is also big, but this is a new unit. They've already replaced it. When you get on the inside, people will say, did they just use a ZF trans in here because it looks like the Digi shifter from the ZF? It is not. It is made in house by Hyundai and I'm sorry, Hyundai Kia, Genesis, Kia. yeah. It's a brand new unit, and one of the things that they did is they reduced the, the length of the trans case by 10 millimeters, and it, they dropped the weight of it by eight kilograms, which may not sound like a lot, but they're evolving the design of it, and it is much quicker to respond than the previous generation that we saw in the G80. All right, Scott, the last thing to talk about underneath here is we have the service panel off here, which you don't have to remove to get to the oil filter and the drain plug for the oil. And you also found that this car has an engine oil dipstick. Yeah, it's not luxury anymore. Yeah. I said, get it out of here. Oh, you just want digital everything, mm -hmm. sensors. So you have to wait 10 minutes to find out what your oil and level let is. It warm up too. Yeah. yeah. This is so much better in terms of serviceability, at least in that part for regular maintenance. Uh, I, I do like the fact that it has a dipstick and it's easy to service here. There's also. The, the biggest thing about the G90 and the G8, G80 is there is a lot of attempts to quiet this down. There's aerodynamics that are involved with the front cover. The As way you that, pointed out. Oh yeah, you found, no, you found it. You found it. It looks like a feminine hygiene product that's oh, stapled got, on there. It's got a large one, a small one and a large one. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, they just ran out of what they could use in their bathrooms and they just stapled them on here. But no, there are brake ducts on both sides which feed from the front inlets of the bumper. And then there are aerodynamic portals in the side of the bumper that helps flow air through the front bumper and it exits along the outside part of the car that moves it around the side of the wheel. So- You know what I just noticed? Look at this freaking intercooler, bro. <laughs> yeah, that is serious. I didn't realize it was that big. I didn't no, know why I wasn't paying attention. Well, yeah. it's huge. And that's another aspect of this car and why you're, when you drive this, you realize how good this twin turbo motor is. It, you know, they haven't stuffed some minuscule intercooler in here like a lot of the eco turbos. There's gonna be less chance of this heat soaking as much. Again, they've designed this from the ground up to be multi-purpose in many different types of platforms or styles of vehicles. So uh, again, it's gonna be exciting to see what they do here. Scott, finally made it under the hood. You know what we got here? Twin turbo V6. Yeah, pretty serious one at that. This is a first. I wouldn't go serious, but... It's serious for them. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Their first twin turbo car, and it doesn't fail to impress even in a 4,750-pound all-wheel drive beast. Still got a lot of pull. This is something that Hyundai has been developing for years. Another motor that has cost them upwards of $60 million in development. Man. And uh, this is going to be their go-to motor on several different models. There's no doubt about it. Are they gonna put this in the Snada or the Tuxen? The Tuxen could use it, yeah. Twin motor, so one <clears throat> Are they gonna put it like... in the Soul? <laughs> I Since think the Turbo Soul was too fast for you. Yeah, it was too fast. I think if they put this in the Soul, the Soul would do this. <laughs> the back end would flip up. But here's the nice thing about it. We start to talk about this underneath the car and the more we talk about it, the more it's evident that this is still an easily serviceable car to a certain extent. You're getting the same grill. Oh wait, is that a Mazda? Wait, was that a Volt? Wait, Audi? What the hell is it? Damn man, I can't keep track anymore. Oh, it's a Chrysler. Some guy at work who has an Audi, he came up, he's like, boy, did they really steal everything from Audi on the front end? I'm like, they, everybody does. I know, it's everybody. And I think, you know, as a brand, this is going to be part of their uphill battle, I think. But it's not just them. No, it's not. Well, what car did you have when you were at the gas station and they said, oh man, Chrysler's come a long way? Yeah, it was the G80. Was it? Yeah, the guy came up and he thought it was a 300, or, you know, one of the Chrysler products. 
So here's one thing that they're doing differently than other brands that they're trying to separate themselves with. And that is the dealership experience because a lot of people that have been through Hyundai ownership know that sometimes the dealership experience isn't the best. How do you separate a luxury brand from that? Easy. What? Put a little Starbucks cafe in there. Done. They've done one better. When you have to they have- put an uh, Apple Eye store in there? <laughs> even better than that. No. Yeah, even better. You don't have to go in. They, oh, they come and get it they for you? They pick up the car and drop off a loaner to you at wherever you're at, uh, an exact car that you have. So you don't have to go to the dealership for any of your maintenance. And they do that for three years, and I'm sure you can buy a longer maintenance plan. But that's one of the re ways they're trying to separate this from the other brands is making it more personal. So you don't have to deal with the dealership experience. And I'm sure it saves money on overhead for dealers not having to have a, a massive, you know, like the Lexus dealership in whatever that is, Palatine or that has what, indoor golfing and a massage parlor, a theater, yeah, all this crap that you have to do to cater to these luxury customers. They've kind of weeded that out and just, hey, here's your loaner car, we're picking it up, you don't have to deal with shit. And that's a nice feature for- But that's only for how many years? Three years, while it's under warranty. So it's just like the Hyundai warranty, you get 10, 10 years, 100,000 miles on the powertrain, and then six years on everything else, assuming you're the original owner. So. You know, I hope they do well with this. I'm really impressed with it. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just a matter of will people buy it? You know, and that's, that's the biggest thing here. some serious ass <laughs> you would never think with this 3.3 liter turbo that this would be anywhere near what you would expect from a vehicle of this size and weight I, I thought getting into it I would need the V8 but I think for most people uh, this twin turbo is really amazing and I think the biggest thing for it is it's going to be an incredible platform or motor for the lighter weight vehicles if they start to get this into more of a sports car you better watch out. The Genesis G90 is a car that is designed to be a straight up cruiser. This is the executive luxury car of the century from, well, Hyundai and Genesis. And you would think immediately that this thing would be a straight up boat. And I think that's my biggest surprise here. As we take this thing through the turns, it has a level of solidity that is like, reminds me very much of the way BMW is set up. It's not sloppy. The damping is, it just feels like a much lighter car. The only time you really can tell the weight is when you're on the brakes. And I think this is one area, and I know the V6 has a little bit smaller brakes than the V8, but that's the only time I can really tell that this car is just a beast. Other than that, it responds exactly the way you want it to. And a large part of that is, well, because of the all-wheel drive system, which kind of varies itself based on your driving mode. So through the turns, I'm in sport mode, which you know firms up the dampers, gets the all-wheel drive set up, more optimized for handling. And then, of course, it sharpens throttle response, Hearing, all that stuff that you usually see, but you can really drive this thing flat out on the street, uh, and I'm really, really shocked by that. Okay, the two most important things you want to know about the G90. We're going to take this and put this in individual mode, which you can change in the menus to set up your transmission, your 
suspension settings, uh, and some of the other tweaks that you can make. And I, I set up individual to be in Comfort Plus, which on most cars you get Sport, Sport Plus, all that. This car goes in reverse. And I like individual because I can set that and still have more of aggressive transmission motor behavior. In Comfort Plus, the softest suspension setting, this car is one of the best riding vehicles I've ever been in, you know, under like $150,000. You have to go to an extreme price range to get this level of damping, isolation, you know, just body control over broken pavement. It spoils you so much that getting into any other car uh, after this, you know, again, under that $100,000 price range is going to be extremely difficult. And just to highlight that, I just got out of the Volvo S90, which some people say is an incredible ride. I think it feels like crap compared to this car. And it's just a testament to how solid and well built this, the overall chassis is. And finally, they have the suspension right on the G80 and G90. It is really one of the most incredible parts about this car. The second thing that I really enjoy about the G90 is its level of isolation from the world around you. Now, I've gotten emails from people that say, why don't you do measured decibel testing? And the reality is, is I do do that, but I don't really talk about it because what I found is, depending on the day, depending on the wind, all the different factors, tire noise from different cars, the decibel rating that you get is oftentimes not that accurate. If you especially in the winter if there's 20 mile an hour winds today well it's going to throw off the decibel reading of the way that i have it set up but what i can tell you is the measurements that i did get uh, in normal cruising this is also one of the quietest cars you're going to get into you can tell the glass that they used in here the sound insulation the microfiber uh, headliner and all the other substructure on the inside of the car makes this very very refined and again along with the ride comfort and the interior silence it's just a really impressive experience now there's a couple things to note that are negative besides the brakes i think one of the things that i've noticed right away and other people that have gotten into this car is the side view mirrors seem just obese i you know they're always in your grill you i always see them and yes they're mounted on the doors which is better for aerodynamics but namely the passenger side side view mirror it just is so in your way it's to a total blind spot and i'm you know i'm not sure what they could do here i think it's just positionally they're they're going to offend some people is the point depending on your seating position the next thing that i've noticed about the car and this is the one negative part about the driving well the actual suspension damping on bad roads it is amazing but once you get into higher speed highway driving if you're in the softer setting the suspension is under dampened by quite a bit. You feel just a, a lot of, uh, it just feels under control. There's not enough rebound in the damping. So what I do is when I'm on the highway above 65, 70, especially on concrete surfaces, I switch the car over to sport mode, which firms up the dampers and it gets rid of that kind of under dampened feel. And then of course the transmission still just is not quick enough to respond to my liking and aggressive driving. Again, it favors more of the sluggish, you know, putting around and you know again that's just tuning as well but for the most part this is one of the most enjoyable impressive driving experiences for the price that you can get namely when you consider the competition is just ridiculously overpriced in some cases now when you plop yourself into the new g90 the first thing you're going to notice is just how comfortable these seats are namely once they're broken in and you're going to hear this more and more from manufacturers how they're working with orthopedic doctors and doctors in general on working on ergonomics with seats this is no different and there's about a 50 way adjustment on here which is just ridiculous it's almost confusing when you're driving and trying to adjust the seat it's one of those seats you almost have to get dialed in before you even start off and drive now so far i've recorded this with the window down or the door open i'm going to close this and all the glass is now up and you can hear just how tight the audio has gotten and it's more so it's noticeable more in here than pretty much any other car i've been in lately now, when you look at this interior as a whole, you can tell this is probably one of the best designed with the most attention to detail vehicles Hyundai and now Genesis has ever done. 
from the button texture to the knobs and rotary selectors to the overall feel and all the materials from the leather to the stitching all around this car it's just kind of a great place to be so instead of just kind of going over all of this stuff let's talk about the pros and cons of the interior and i've already talked about it the seats and the attention to detail are the biggest pro the other thing is you have adjustable headrests that go forward and aft and up and down which you know helps with whiplash in case of an accident now let's talk about some of the negatives and a lot of these can be easily fixed or updated or changed during the life cycle they don't have to redo everything my first problem is this wood trim that they claim is real. It goes along the doors, it's on the seats, on the dash. My biggest question about this is why would you go through the effort to put wood when it looks fake? It doesn't look real at all. It looks like something that's out of a 2000 Chrysler town and country. The fake glued on you know, plastic wood trim. And that's what it is in here. And it brings down the whole cabin for me. Namely when you get out of like the G80, which uses a natural wood finish or the Volvos or even Mazda's using a natural wood finish in their vehicles now. And it's, this just doesn't look good. I'm sorry. I would like to see an option for like an alloy trim or a carbon trim or something else to get rid of this because it just, again, it takes down the whole interior for me. The next thing is you have all these solid alloys and touch points and solid feeling things. And then you get to the door handles, which feel like they're this cheap plastic off of a $20,000 car. And again, it's some of the attention to details here. And then there's other points where you're just like, hmm, did they just forget about that? Or were they cutting costs? But I'm not really sure. But those are two of the things that I noticed. Now, there's a couple other things I take exception to on the interior of the G90. And they're not a huge deal, but it's worth noting. The first thing I want to say is plenty of times companies decide they're going to change things for the sake of changing them, even though they've worked for a long time and people are used to them. But hey, you know what? This is the way things work. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is this digi shifter or gear selector. Now, ZF has been doing this on their automatic transmission on other cars and people complain about it. But here you have a joystick style shifter, which does not have physical detents. It does not have a solid mechanical click. And the worst part is a shifter like this, typically you'd think, well, I'm gonna push in the button and go to park. You push in the button and move it all the way forward. On this car, all the way forward is reverse and it doesn't even click into it. It just digitally selects it. To go into park, you have to push a button in front of it. And it's just something that is just changed for the sake of it. It doesn't bring any value or it doesn't make it any better. It just makes it more confusing. And that's something I just hate about modern technology. The second thing is, the storage space. It's a little cumbersome. The door pockets for how big this car is, they suck. I mean, you can barely fit anything in there. You can't fit bottles. They don't extend, they don't adjust. And it's just something with how big this car is, they could easily massage that to make it just more usable. Your cup holders, uh, it just seems like something out of a Sonata, honestly. It just doesn't seem like there's much thought given to it. There's not very much adjustability. And you get out of Lexus with their kind of elevator style cup holders. There's just really no thought given to it here. Your armrest is a little confined. I mean, again, storage space in terms of nooks and crannies is not the greatest on the inside here. Now let's take it back to the positive because there's one storage area here that blows me away. And I know this is so silly, but after being in so many cars that get this wrong, they get it right here. There's a phone storage area where you can slide your phone into this little cavern. There's an aux connector in here, a USB cable so you can charge or hook up to aux and a wireless charging pad. Now the best thing about it isn't that it fits, you know, it fits a phone, it fits plus size phones. If you're somebody that's into plus size things, I have an LG V20, which is just way too big. Then it fits the iPhone plus the bigger iPhone. And of course the new pixel plus you slide it in here. It fits perfectly. You don't have to worry about it flying around. You don't forget where it's at. You don't have to go digging for it. It's one of the best like design cubbies I've seen in any car recently. So that's a huge pro. Now, of course, with the G90, you're getting a completely or somewhat different infotainment, and that is because you have a massive 21 by 9 screen here. And the home screen dial, the way this is laid out is extremely simple, and that is because there is a physical command knob to just navigate the whole thing. You don't have to deal with a touchscreen. There is no touchscreen. And once you get used to this, 
it's so simple to use in terms of audio, navigation, the Blue Link, the radio. The radio, you know, you can use your physical tuning knob or this giant command knob here at the bottom. It just works extremely well. Now, the other thing that you're able to do is turn off the screen completely with one touch because they've included a display button here, which is really nice at night. Now through here, you can pretty much do all your audio functions. This has a Lexicon higher end audio system. Uh, it is not at a elite level, but it is at an 80%. Now one of the other things here they've included from the lower end models uh, from Hyundai is the Clarify tech, which improves you know, your kind of audio in compressed states, like your Sirius XM or your Bluetooth. And the cool thing here is you can toggle the Clarify setting on and off, which is something I asked about you couldn't do on the cheaper models, but you can do it here and you can really tell the difference. Now I know the Equus or the old car used to originally be kind of a limo in Korea. When you look at the back seat, this is why this is kind of one of those executive cars where you feel like you should be chauffeured around. The amount of space back here is just so stupid. I mean, you could be probably 500 pounds or just a monster like sports athlete, a football player, basketball player, and still have room to spare. It is really crazy. Not only that, you have vents, your own individual control back here for HVAC, seat heaters. It's just a tremendous place to be in terms of comfort. Now, there are some things to note, like you have electronic window shades, which when you push this button, it goes up like a window and it comes down and you can even control the back window shade, which is also pretty incredible uh, from sitting back here. You can also control the infotainment from all the knobs and switches on the back seat, which is a huge pro. But this center armrest here that goes up and down the command center, to pull this back up in the seat, it's like moving an elephant. It is so heavy, it is ridiculous. But one of the biggest things to note is when you get the V6 version, like this car is, you don't get reclining seats and you don't get cooled seats back here. You have to go up to the V8, which to me is very strange why they wouldn't include that as an option here to just have this totally loaded. But again, that's something to note. So Scott, this is it. Final impressions. And I think we've talked about this in the shop. We've driven it. We've I've even it. ridden in the back. Yes, you've ridden in the back. And I would say, I would say for what they're trying to do here, they are not far off. A lot of things they need to change are very minimal. The biggest problem they're gonna face and the biggest uphill is convincing people to buy this car. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend it. I would say if I was looking for a luxury car that I didn't want to have to deal with a lot of bullshit, it's pretty much Lexus in this right now. But I'm, again, that's very hard sell for somebody that is more in the European market. Mm -hmm. they, they, if people that want BMWs, Mercs, Audis, unless, like you said, unless they had a bad experience with those, it's if they're gonna, it's gonna take some time to get people over to this. Well, yeah, and that just knowing that it's not something special. Well, I mean, it is, but it's still building that. That brand reputation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm impressed with it. I look forward to trying the five liter out and the new G80. We're, we're gonna have the G80 as well, which is really, we've already driven it, just rebranded. But um, again, if you're in the market for a vehicle like this, it just, at the very least, whether you like Hyundai or Genesis or whatever or not, drive this back to back with one of the cars you're looking at, either the S-Class, the LS, or a GS, whatever, or a seven series or a five series, just at least give this a shot. And with the 3.3 liter, I think most people are gonna be pleasantly surprised by it. I agree.